Now time for today's keynote. So it gives me great pleasure in welcoming Lee Morfried. Hello. Hello. I'm here. This is Welcome. amazing because I've never been up this early. It's what, like 9 a.m. for you? This is like a... I get to fake it, you know, I'm like never up that early, um, but it's awesome. I'm, I'm here in New York City, uh, and it's great to be able to speak here at LinuxConf Australia. I, I've never been to Australia. I, I don't know when I'll be able to go there because um, my country is totally screwed up right now, but when possible, I would love to visit. Well, we'd love to have you here. I know our Swag Badge team were very keen to be able to get to see you, and I think you've seen a little bit of about our Swag Badge. Yeah, it's so the top. It's one of the 167 will... slides. <laughs> We're looking forward to it very much. Okay. So I'll hand over to you, Limor, and we'll enjoy your keynote. All right. Thank you. I'll enjoy it. And uh, if the people watching don't enjoy it, well, I'm sorry, but that's what it is. I'm the keynote speaker. So uh, I'm going to tell you a love story today. It's a beautiful love story between uh, this snake, Blinka, oh, which I'm wearing on my shirt, but it's also my first slide. Let's go back there. Okay. Let's stick like this. Thank you, Chris. Um, and uh, Blink is our mascot for CircuitPython, but I want to tell you like the background, the history, and the story behind this because I'm at the point where I'm now meeting kids who like do not remember what it was like to do electronics, and so they don't know why we made some choices. And I thought that it could be illuminating and uh, perhaps inspiring to know the story behind Blinka, this wonderful snake. So um, to start off, um, so I'm Lamor Freed, uh, Lady Ada, and I run this company called Adafruit, and that's me me uh, in front of my pick and place machines. Uh, I went to school for electronics. I like building electronics. And uh, for some reason, I just didn't want to get a job where somebody told me what to do. So instead, I got a job where I tell myself what to do. And it sucks a lot more. But I get to build cool electronics all day. So you know, we have 100 plus people. We're in New York City. Um, we're a kind of couple blocks from the Prada store and the Apple store. Um, which is pretty exciting. And um, we do electronics and making and 3D printing and all sorts of just like fun stuff that uh, we've been kind of doing this for, you know, 15 plus years, since 2005, when I started making synthesizers and uh, MP3 players from scratch to now we make, you know, 4,000 different, uh, we stock 4,000 different products and make about 400. Um, we tend to make microcontrollers, uh, little boards that have LEDs or sensors and buttons, and people can program them. And so this is kind of what got me really excited about electrical engineering. When I went to school, I was actually a computer scientist. Uh, I studied uh, like s software systems and compilers and stuff. And I thought like, wow, like engi electrical engineering totally sucks because all you do is make stereo systems. But then I, I got interested in microcontrollers, and I'll, I'll show you the microcontroller that I, I learned on. And that totally captivated me because I was very excited to uh, you know, if I'm going to get carpal tunnel from typing, at least I want to be able to show it off at the local pub. So um, here's like two boards that we design and manufacture uh, in New York City. And this is a pre-COVID photo on our roof. Uh, so some of the people we have here, we have a whole team, shipping, engineering, facilities, production, finance, uh, everyone here. Uh, a lot of us were all black, but not all of us. There's some exceptions. During uh, the last year, uh, we've helped out also with New York City's uh, COVID response. Uh, New York City got hit really hard in April, uh, and it was really bad. Um, you know, we couldn't get face shields, for example, for medical professionals. Uh, so, you know, we had rolls of plastic, and we had foam, and we had laser cutters and 3D printers. And so we kind of jumped up and said, OK, well, if we're not going to be manufacturing electronics because everything is shut down and locked down, um, how about we help out instead by um, helping make face shields? We made a couple thousand face shields for doctors. And here's, here's some friends of ours who are um, wearing them. Um, we also are working and are, have worked and are still working with folks making open source ventilators using the software and hardware that we've designed because it's easily, uh, it's easy to use, it's well documented, and they can quickly integrate it, um, getting these DIY ventilators and sensor systems for uh, ventilators. And also now, what's interesting is a lot of people are using our sensors to do um, air quality and air movement studies because uh, ventilation is really important. You know, how, uh, how open do the windows have to be to make sure that you're getting full air circulation, but not so open that everyone's freezing cold and you have to blast the heat and use a ton of energy. So using uh, airflow sensors and CO2 sensors is part of that as well. And uh, there's our factory, which is kind of cool. We're not the whole thing. We don't have the whole thing. We share it with a bunch of other companies uh, as well. 
including a Starbucks in the basement, which was, at the time was like super deadly because like I would have a coffee like every day. Okay, so let's actually get started with the talk itself. So I'm going to start in the beginning of what it was like to build electronics because we have to like go full circle from what it used to be, which was actually really awesome, uh, to like this really murky period to now, which is again, really awesome. So computers used to come with like these parallel ports on the back, um, these really big DB25 pin things that were designed for printers or scanners. Um, and you can actually, I, I looked around, so on Newegg, you can't buy computers with these, but you know, there's are still sellers of um, motherboards that have parallel ports on them, and there's still parallel port drivers in Linux and Windows. And it was really cool because you had eight pins, general purpose input or output, um, and you had a couple of like, you know, busy and ACK and whatever pins, you could tell the paper end, this is for printing, you know, it was basically a printer port. But you could really abuse the heck out of this thing because you basically had a direct line to pins that would go high and low. Um, so for example, you can still to this day buy these CNC controllers. So these are for like um, DIY, like kind of like 3D printers, but they cut material away. Um, CNC lathes, CNC mills, CNC drawing machines. They're actually, people still use parallel ports because there's actually, um, and here's an example of, of a build. You know, I found this photo on Flickr and it's, you can sort of see in the, the, the bottom right here, this is the parallel port converter. And then uh, it's plugged into this board. And then these are like motor drivers, which are massive motor chips. And this would be your CNC machine. Um, and this is from the manual for the software. I just thought this clip art was just so awesome. I had to share with you. Um, but basically, you know, on the bottom left here, you'd have a computer and then you have the power and, and uh, data lines. It only shows four wires here, but it's really the whole parallel port. Um, and then you would run the software on the computer and the software would run on Windows 3.1 pretty much was kind of the only thing, although there were some Linux uh, CAM softwares written eventually. Um, and it would literally just say, okay, to move the stepper forward, toggle the pin once for every step and the stepper would move. Super cool. Loved it. Um, this is, you know, the, the parallel port assignment, depending on, uh, you know, what hardware you would plug in, you would align the uh, pin number for the parallel port to your printer axis. So here you've got like X and Y and Z and, and all sorts of good stuff. So um, this was a software called Mac 3, which again, you can still buy it, um, although I don't think a lot of people use it. Um, but yeah, if you if you look for a parallel port motherboard on Newegg, all you get are these like adapters. Like they don't they don't sell computers with parallel ports really anymore. It's it's quite rare to get. Um, although if you you know if you're looking for just that, you probably would. But like my modern computer, it doesn't have one. Why? Because we got USB instead. And I don't blame them, right? I mean, like on one hand. This was like an idyllic time of like innocence when we had parallel ports and we would just plug whatever the hell we wanted into them. But it, it does limit you. There, you couldn't have more complicated protocols. Um, there were speed reasons. You could only have one parallel port, whereas now I think my computer has like 18,000 USB ports. So, you know, we had USB and sort of all that, eventually those parallel ports started disappearing. So that was, I think, you know, basically like 2000 up to the year 2000. So 2001, 2002, about till then, people were still doing parallel port stuff. And then around 2005-ish um, or so, um, sorry, around 2002 or three-ish or so, um, this microcontroller chip came out. And this is the 16F84. And in my opinion, this chip is uh, as important as like the 68,000 or something Motorola chip. I mean, those are important chips too, don't get me wrong, or the 386. But this chip was really cool. Um, now it only had, you know, 1,024 words of program memory. So basically a kilobyte of memory, 68 bytes of RAM. You know, only had a couple, only had 35 instructions to learn. You would code this in assembly, right? There, at the time, you weren't even coding it in C, although people did write compilers later for it. But what was cool about it was the enhanced, enhanced, look, it's enhanced, flash microcontroller. Okay, why? Because up till that point, all microcontrollers that you would get, like little devices that could toggle pins up and down, um, like those parallel ports, but you would program, came with a EEPROM memory like this, 
with a with a glass or a crystal window in it and this is a big ceramic chip and these would cost like 20 bucks or so 10 20 dollars and you would have to use a uv eraser and i used to, i actually still have i think somewhere my uv eraser uh this is a very fancy one uh, i like how it has a pull out drawer and everything but the most important thing to note about this uv eraser is the erase time okay that's in minutes not seconds You'd be, you'd be waiting 10, 20 minutes sometimes to erase your flash. And here's the thing. If you pulled your flash out too early from the eraser, not all of the bits would be erased. And so when you tried to reprogram it, it would fail on verification. And then you'd have to erase it again. So you just like lost twice as much time. Tragic. But the nice thing about this, the PIC uh, 16F84 shown here on the first microcontroller board I used, was that it did not have that glass window. Why? Or crystal window? Because you could actually program it in situ. You, you, it would erase itself like instantaneously in a second or two. And so you could, amazing, program it and then reprogram it within like a minute or two. Like you just have to recompile it and then, you know, connect whatever program or dongle you had and you could program it again. So this is amazing. Um, in fact, uh, at the time, you could program these chips through a parallel port that's kind of combining the joy of parallel ports with the joy of microcontrollers. Um, so one of the first board designs I ever did featuring the ATtiny 2313, also a very early enhanced flash microcontroller, um, but this one with a slightly more risky, uh, uh, instead of Cisky instruction set, you can see that there's this parallel port on the side. You would literally like jam that into the back of your computer and then run the command line program to program it with your um, compiled micro bit code and then this would flash the leds this was a little led flasher thing it would flash the leds back and forth and you could make patterns with it this is what we had for entertainment back in those days um but again you know the the there's this like usb uh we 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 love this parallel port but eventually the parallel port went away and um the one of the side effects was that about 2005, because there was so much USB going around, um, this is sort of where Arduino came up. What, Arduino is kind of a com combination of these two things. This is a, a much later Arduino, but the first one looked similar. But if you look down here, enhanced flash microcontroller can be reprogrammed without a UV eraser. And it has a USB port, big chunky parallel uh, printer port. Um, USB, so like the, the B type, and then a USB to serial converter. This would take USB data and convert it to a friendly, you know, RX and TX data in, data out signal. Um, and you would plug it into your computer uh, using a USB cable, one of these new amazing uh, uh, protocols for your computer. You would run the ID and you'd program it. And I'm sure almost everyone watching this has programmed an ID, uh, Arduino using the IDE or a similar ID, it's really common. I mean, this this has been now 15 years in the making, um, nonstop, it's kind of the standard for uh, electronics. And um, so there's a, this is like a lovely diagram I made like 20 years ago, but your basically data is moving back and forth between the uh, computer and the Arduino and you can send and receive data as ASCII, just like a terminal, basically data coming back and forth. And so let's say you want to measure the temperature in your home. Like there's, I think, a talk later I saw about, you know, um, measuring uh, stuff in your home and automating it. So um, you would get a, a temperature sensor, even have one here. This is a TMP36, although there's many others. This is a very simple, uh, easy to use analog temperature sensor. You give it some voltage on the leftmost pin, on the right-hand pin you connect ground, and an analog voltage comes out. You do a little bit of math on the analog voltage and you can get the temperature. Uh, amazing, right? So, um, you know, this is a original Arduino, the Deci one of the earlier Arduinos, the Deutschimila. You wire it up, there's an analog input, and then you would open up the IDE, right? This is special software that, would, that was written in Java that would run on uh, Mac, Windows, or Linux. This is the code you would put in. It's C code with some macros called Arduino E's. In my opinion, it's basically just C with some macro help. Um, and you can see in the setup, you, I don't know, maybe the text is a little small, but you, you set up your serial port, you do an analog read, you multiply the voltage around just to get it into like, you know, the, the right format, a convert it to centigrade, and then you print it out to the serial port. 
Um, so, and then if you open up the serial port uh, with the terminal software, uh, Minicom works, you know, Zterm works, whatever you want really would work, you will get something like this. It tells you, okay, I read this analog voltage and this is the temperature. It's about 80 degrees at the time. Um, and then like, let's say you wanted to connect this to your computer. Like, let's say you want to read the temperature and then actually like data log it or something, or maybe you want your computer to send you an email when the temperature gets too high or too low. Maybe you're, you're brewing beer or you're, you're monitoring your greenhouse, what have you. Uh, you could run some Python code. This is a, a different project, but it kind of was the only file I could quickly, uh, uh, find on my, um, computer. And this is in Python 2. You use the uh, Python serial library, you open up the serial port, COM1, dev TTY, USB 0, what have you. You read the bytes in, you parse them, and then now you have that data that's been transmitted from, sorry, from the Arduino. Data has been transmitted to your computer, and then your computer can act on it. So the Arduino can run on its own. But if you want to have that data show up on your computer, you have to sort of transmit it and then do this parsing thing um, where you would you con convert the data from the serial port into a floating point number or what have you. This was great. So people did this for basically forever. But they're still doing it. It's been 15 years. And what's nice about this is the, the, compi the right compile, upload, debug loop is quite smaller than it used to be. So that one of the things that's nice about this is that it's uh, only about two to three minutes between I'm writing code, I'm compiling it, I'm uploading it, and I'm testing it. And, you know, one thing that I've, I've definitely learned as I've written more and more code is that shorter you can make that loop, the better it is. Because you can learn from your mistakes faster, you can debug faster, your whole life is just better, you can get up and stretch more. You know, overall, I think it's it's a really good positive thing, and compared to EEPROM based programming, uh, this is so much superior that it caused this explosion in Arduinos, and that's why like Arduino basically took over. It was such a superior way of programming. And then, uh, so everyone's like really happy. And then, um, about 2012, the Raspberry Pi came out, right? And everybody remembers like they first heard about this thing and it's like, what is this? It's a single board Linux computer. What is that? It's like a little thing. I have one here. This is a, a Pi 4 credit card sized computer, about 40 bucks that can run Linux. It runs Debian or a fork of Debian. This is the, uh, one of the original ones, not the very first, but uh, an early, early one. It's kind of like a, a, like a younger sister of the ones that most people have these days, but I like how it has an RCA jack. It's like so cool um, as well as HDMI. Uh, two USB ports, an Ethernet. And I want to say, this is not the first single board computer, right, at all. There was the Chumbi board, um, which even had GPIO. It ran, uh, it's a Freescale processor. It had US multiple USB ports, audio, ran off of five volts, has a little, a jaunty little RAM chip over here, quite cute. Uh, it even had, if you look here, this is a VGA output connector, so you could connect it to um, not necessarily VGA, but a TFT display. So it even had TFT built in. Um, there's also the long history of PC 104 boards, right? These plug and play kind of stackable computer thingies. Um, if you've never had to use this, that's really awesome. Uh, congratulate yourself. Um, they were kind of a nightmare. I did once get one working and like, it took me like three weeks. And then I was just like, what am I doing? And I went and did something else. Um, there's also the BeagleBone and the Beagle board also came before the Raspberry Pi, all, all, all kind of coming out around 2010, right? And the thing about the Linux, the thing about the Raspberry Pi single board computer and why it won is basically it was just 40 bucks. Like nobody could compete with the price and the simplicity of it. And that's kind of important because as we talk about why things happened, it's basically two things, simplicity and price. Those are like the really, the, like power is not that important, its capabilities as long as you fulfilled the simplicity and price prerequisites. Um, you know, but given that it was really sweet that the Raspberry Pi had ethernet, I think that was also a big thing because it was, and USB, you could plug in a USB Wi-Fi dongle, you could connect to the internet, you could do internet projects very easily and very cheaply. Um, in fact, chances are you probably have a Raspberry Pi at home. It's running like a 
you know, home assistant, or maybe it's running pie hole, or you've got it doing some, uh, you know, data logging thing for you, or it's emulating video games uh, that you play with your kids. Uh, very popular because they're, you know, five to thirty-five dollars. You can buy them at um, c computer stores. You can buy them online. You can even get them on Amazon. So one thing that's kind of fun, I, I love this fun fact. This is from Liz, the uh, she's the co-found co-founder of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, and the uh, director of communications. And some people said, like, well, why is the Raspberry Pi called what it is? And she's like, well, Raspberry is kind of a pun on Apple, but the Pi stands for Python. And it was interesting to me that when the Raspberry Pi came out, they basically said the official language of the Raspberry Pi is Python. And they have Scratch, which is a, a beginner block-based programming language, but they really pushed Python. Python is like the way you were expected to program this. And given that you had a 700 megahertz ARM Cortex you know, A7 or whatever processor, it's totally reasonable to run Python as your main language. Um, so going back to, okay, now we want to rebuild that example that we had with the Arduino and the temperature sensor. We're going to use a different temperature sensor. This is a, an I squared C temperature sensor. So it uses digital data and not analog. Why? Because the Raspberry Pi doesn't have an analog input. That's one of the trade-offs that you get. It doesn't have as many peripherals as the Arduino does um, in some ways. It has digital and it has HDMI, but it doesn't have analog and it doesn't really have PWM and, and a couple other things. And you know, one wire you can do, but it's a little bit weird. Um, so you, you wire it up using the, the pins on the, on the side of the Raspberry Pi. Can, these little guys here, you use little socket wires, you plug it in. Uh, we wrote a library and this library you know, is in Python 2 and you can see all the Pythonisms. Um, and uh, we use logger to keep, you know, to, to log what's going on. And uh, we wrote a little helper library called Adafruit GPIO just to do a little bit of the I squared C, SM bus, ioctal stuff, which is kind of a pain. Um, but on the Raspberry Pi, you log in you, as a terminal. Uh, you run sudo apt-get update. You install Python. Make sure you're running Python. Um, and then you have to install RPI GPIO. And RPI GPIO is this library that does memory mapped I it's memory mapped noodling to basically let you get access to the input and output. This is before libgpiod. Maybe one day we will all live in a libgpiod land, but pretty much everyone's memory mapping instead. Um, you also pip install the library. This is the example code. It's pretty simple. You know, there's a little helper function, but mostly you import the library, you create the sensor, you start the sensor, you give it a little print out and then you just read the sensor data and, and display it and time sleep in between. And uh, oops, sorry. Right. And um, you uh, that example comes with the library. You go into the example folder, you run uh, Python simple test and you get the temperature out. So now you have your temperature data, but it's on your Raspberry Pi computer. So if you, again, want to get this data off of this Raspberry Pi computer, you either have to use Ethernet or Wi-Fi and send it to some service, or you can, you know, open up a socket and have another computer connect to it and somehow, like, you have to transfer the data to somewhere else, especially if you want it on, like, your desktop computer. Um, but you do have that internet capability. And what's really cool about Python, and I'd kind of been writing Python before, but I never really got into it that much until the Raspberry Pi, is that it's even faster, right? So you went from a 15, 20 minute per program cycle to Arduino where you're using a C compiler to uh, write, compile, upload, execute, debug loop of about two, three, four minutes. And now we have like an interpreted language that's basically instantaneous. You are, you are running and saving code and rerunning it in like under five or 10 seconds because it's loading instantly into memory. There's no compilation step. And that's, that's really powerful because when we're moving from compiled to interpreted, um, we get a lot of benefits, although of course there's uh, some downsides. So let's go back into microcontroller land because we had just been talking about 
microcomputers, right? This is a computer. It's not a microcontroller. It's running a full operating system, Linux. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. And, you know, you're doing things in the file system and you're installing software and you're running pip and you've got a shell and all that good stuff. But when we're talking about, you know, microcontrollers, like say this Pico, it does not run an operating system, right? When you, when you compile to this, your code is running directly on the bare metal, which is kind of cool because you have full control over the chip, but it also means you, you have to take care of the whole chip on your own. Anyways, uh, you know, as about the same time that the Raspberry Pi was coming out, folks were saying like, well, the Arduino is cool, but like this is like 700 megahertz and it runs like software really fast and that's kind of cool. I can do a lot more things with it. And um, Arduino had come out with the Due. And the Due, I, personally, I'm not a huge fan of the Due because it had some weird bugs in it uh, that drove me a little crazy. But one thing that was neat about the Due is it was like, just as we had moved from UVEE prompt chips to enhanced flash chips, we are now moving to a next generation of like high performance, although I'm sure if you watch this 10 years from now, you'll think of this as like a rinky dink chip. At, at the time, this was, a, and still is, a fairly high performance chip. Um, it's a 32-bit ARM Cortex, so it's 32-bit, not 8-bit, so it can process data much faster. It's running at 84 megahertz compared to an Arduino running at 16. It has a grand total of half a megabyte of flash up to 100 kilobyte of SRAM. Okay, like, look, obviously this is not a ton, but it's, you know, easily an order or two magnitude more than the original Arduino that we were talking about in 2005, or even the enhanced flash PIC 16 F84 from, um, you know, back in, in 2000, 2001. Um, so this is the, the, the chip that was used in the Arduino. So if you look at the slides, you can compare uh, between the two. I mean, they're totally different processes, totally different generations. It's not fair to compare them. This one came, you know, a decade before. Um, but now we're talking about chips that are, you know, they're, they're kind of getting to like your old 286 or 386 speed, right? Like even a turbo button here, which is pretty much why I picked this image, right? The, you know, you think about your 486 or 386 running at 66 megahertz. Well, this is running at 84. And it's got, you know, it doesn't have as much RAM because it doesn't have to run a whole operating system. But, you know, it, it is a 32-bit processor and it's running quite fast. And so when you have extra cycles, you can spend them in different ways. Um, so instead of running code where you're literally just controlling every single command as it's executed, people started using real-time operating systems. Now, FreeRTOS did not get invented around now. This is actually from 2000 also. Um, and they were meant to be used on microcomputers. However, people started using them on microcontrollers because you had enough memory and enough flash that you had overhead available to run a real-time operating system. And so in 2012 to 2014, there was this amazing like Cambrian explosion of interpreted languages running on microcontrollers. And I don't exactly know why, other than I imagine the chips just got powerful enough and cheap enough and, and everyone sort of started seeing, it's also like, you know, when somebody beats like um, a sprint, like a 500 meter sprint, like the first person to like get it under like a minute or whatever, then everybody else is like, whoa, if that's possible, I can do it too. And then the, um, the world record starts dropping even more, right? So this, I don't know that this is the first one. There's probably other um, embedded interpreted languages uh, boards that came before it, but the Esperino is pretty early. So this is 2012 and this board, I also don't know why these boards came in these kind of funky rectangular shapes, but I'm digging it. This board is running, uh, sorry, this board is by Gordon Williams, um, who also uh, headed this project. I'm sure there's other people as well. Um, and this board is running on a microcontroller that's an STM32F1. Lovely series of chips. Again, 256 to 512K of flash, 32-bit, 72 megahertz, right? It's it, this kind of class of microcontroller. And it's fast enough uh, that you can run JavaScript on it. And it's not a full implementation of JavaScript, but it's enough that you can sort of have the JavaScript feeling um, and you can script your microcontroller. Um, I'm sure that Gordon has awesome talks and presentations. So if you want more detail about the implementation, I check the website for Esperino. Um, but this is sort of what it looks like. He has a really cool IDE that runs in the browser. Um, you're now running code that is interpreted. This is not compiled. And 
when you run it, you like click execute and it uplifts the board. And again, instead of that three to four minute compile, upload, verify, run, uh, debug loop, it's, it's shrunk down to the speed of Python on the Raspberry Pi. It's like seconds, basically, five to 10 seconds. Um, there was also the Tessel, which I thought was really cool because this is a really high-powered microcontroller, but it is a microcontroller with a lot of RAM and a lot of flash, and they did like a very large subset of uh, JavaScript running on a microcontroller. It even had Wi-Fi, uh, had all these expansion ports. Um, this is the Tessel team. I uh, just love the exuberant positivity of this team. They're smiling so, so wide. They love their hardware so much. Um, and they're using a uh, LPC 1830. Um, you'll see definitely these are all ARM Cortex chips. Um, ARM did, did a really good job getting low cost, high power microcontrollers out to people around this time. This is an M3 running at 180 megahertz um, with 200K of SRAM, but even put more SRAM on it. Uh, and similarly, they, you, know, you, you run you know, basically JavaScript on it. And in your command line, you even tell it what to do. But yeah, it's basically JavaScript running on a chip that can also connect to the internet and download stuff. And then, of course, there's MicroPython. Uh, this is the well, this is our uh, photo we found of the Pi board V1.1. There's probably a V1.0 before then. Uh, also running on an STM32 F405. Um, uh, this is by Damien George, who uh, has been doing so much with MicroPython and recently completed uh, the Pico port for MicroPython. Congratulations on that release this week. Um, but he sort of looked at uh, these JavaScript boards, I'm assuming, and said, I want to do the same thing for Python. And the cool thing is he didn't know that it wasn't possible. So he, he did it, and it turns out it was possible. A miniaturized version of Python 3 running on a microcontroller. Um, and you get Python code. And you're running like Python 3 code, but it's running on a microcontroller to blink an LED. This is like the, the first example that you run. Um, for blinking an LED. And um, it really kicked off because, and I'm not saying that people don't run Asperino or even Tassel, those are still alive, but again, it was the price and the um, simplicity of it that I think made MicroPython really, you know, branch out and cover the world. Because when they did a Kickstarter, uh, I think a year or two after the uh, Pi board came out, or maybe a year afterwards, they went and um, the Kickstarter was to port it to the ESP8266, a, you know, basically one to two dollar Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller that's a 10 silica chip. And again, just fast enough and just barely good enough to run MicroPython. Um, and this was like a huge success and, and we promoted it and we did some tutorials for it and it was awesome. In fact, if you look, you probably have this badge which is running um, the next generation, the ESP32, the next generation chip, and it's also running MicroPython on this Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller, all on your badge, which is like super neat. It even has two screens. Why two screens? I don't know, but why not, right? Um, and you can program it um, from the command line. You can, you know, get files from Wi-Fi and save them to the file system. It's like people have done such cool stuff with this because it's so easy. It's so fast to get started and going because of that very short iteration loop of, you know, you don't compile, you don't upload, you just write and execute, write and execute. Okay, so let's talk about business and disruption and having fun because I think that this is something that engineers – they know it, but they don't realize it. And that's, there's, you know, if you go to business school, you get an MBA or something, you know, you're going to read uh, Clayton Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma. And it's actually kind of a funny book. Um, not, I mean, it's a good book overall, but it's really funny because it's about hard drives. And they talk about like these massive hard drives, but they end before SSD or flash memory comes up. So like they don't even realize that The Innovator's Dilemma is going to be like innovated like 15 times over by the time you read it. But anyways, you should read it because it is a good book. But basically it says, look, it doesn't matter if there's something that has a wide market, as long as there's something that's cheaper and does like enough stuff that it's interesting and gets adopted, especially the it's less expensive and it's easier to use and performance isn't as important. Um, so as these disk drives in this book were uh, being created, um, they went from, you know, super huge to um, 
you know, smaller and smaller and smaller, and they weren't as good, but it didn't matter because the price and size was improved. And so um, if you look at something like, you know, the Arduino, what was actually innovative about it was not the hardware. I mean, the hardware was wonderful. It's great. Don't get me wrong. It's perfect. But the thing is, is that how easy it was to use comparatively. You know, you've got this IDE and you open it up and you can pretty much just get started writing immediately. Um, so if you want to make like these cool LED goggles, for example, um, you know, we have an Arduino kit for it. This is something that would be really hard to do without Arduino because it's something that cosplayers, beginners want to do. They don't want to have an engineering degree. They just want to get started. Um, or this LED tiara, like that's actually kind of a popular project. A lot of kids want to build their own LED glowing tiara. They do not want to go to school and study like stacks and heaps and compiler design and the dragon book and all that stuff. They just want to get into having fun, right? And that's the thing. It's about having fun with electronics. And before there was Arduino, right? The Arduino was very disruptive because beforehand it was just like a yak shaving nightmare. And it still is, right? So, you know, if you're wanting to write code on the raw Atmel chip that's on the Arduino, um, you download Atmel Studio and it's in VS Code. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's wonderful. There's just too many damn buttons and there's too many file menus and there's like so many tabs, even I don't like using it. Um, and also it's not even available for Linux, even if you wanted to, it's only for Windows. And then let's say you want to change chips. You want to now run something on a MSP430. Okay, well, you're going to have to go into a totally different IDE, Code Composer Studio, for the official way of programming it from TI. NXP, they also have their own IDE. Like, thankfully, they have them available for all operating systems. But it just means that you're suffering in three different operating systems. I don't know, I don't know if that's a really better way of doing it. Um, and of course, you can always use Eclipse. Um, and now there's platform IO and, and these are all good too, but they are still, I would not call them super fun. They're very powerful, but I wouldn't call this fun. Like you, you're, you're happy when you're done, but you're not like enjoying the process. And I say that as someone who writes like five to 10 hours of code a day, this is fun, right? Like Apple basic is fun. You're just getting in there and you're just like doing it. And people start, you know, they say like, well, you know, back in the day, computers were like kids were able to program, you know, computers and all they had was schematics and you had to do assembly and peek and poke. And I'm like, yeah, but they didn't have to deal with Eclipse, right? And if you take that away, then maybe it is easier. Maybe it's the tool chain. Maybe it's the tool system, not the actual programming that's uh, complicated. Um, so this is a, a, a sort of a blurb from a uh, Paul Graham essay from 2001, and I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but maybe you can Google for the first sentence and then you'll find it. And I read this in 2001, right when I was graduating from school, and it's an article about Lisp. And he said the reason that his company was successful was because they wrote their entire application in Lisp, or Lisp variant, um, and not in, uh, you know, whatever C or C++ language that other people were writing web code in. And he said the reason was is that we chose the highest level language possible. And he says, you obviously don't write computers, machine code. We don't write software for computers and machine code. Although at the time, people were writing assembler for microcontrollers, because that 16F84 basically didn't come with a compiler or a free compiler to start. And he says, you should always, if, if there's no other comparison, of course, he goes into like performance and you know, APIs and whatever. But all things being equal, pick the highest level language you can. And why? Because if you look at like the studies of like, you know, this one is a, a compiled studies of how long it takes to solve a, a string parsing problem. You see here Perl and Python are at the top, C++, Java and C are at the bottom. And it's not necessarily the code, it's not the language itself, right? There's nothing, like, they all have for loops and if statements and all that good stuff. And, and you know, you print strings and you have to format them. Um, it's that the number of lines of code you write are smaller. The smaller the amount of code and the faster your development loop, I believe that's, those are the core elements to making it easy to code. Because the number of lines you're coding is about the same per hour. And what I really like about, um, MicroPython and, and CircuitPython, which we'll talk about, is that there's no tool chain at all. I, we actually, it just deletes the tool chain completely. Once you've installed CircuitPython or MicroPython, 
you edit a code.py file, for example, here. And then if you have images or audio, like in this project, uh, I have a little thing that goes on the internet and finds out how many GitHub stars we have, displays the image, and plays a coin sound every time we get a new star. So please star our repos. Um, it all lives on the disk drive. It, a little bit reminiscent for me of ResEdit, for those who, who liked ResEdit hacking um, when they were kids. Um, and then, of course, there's Chromebooks where you can't even install an IDE if you wanted to, right? So you, you have to get rid of the tool chain. And getting rid of the tool chain and being able to delete all the code composer studios and Atmel studios has just been, it's been glorious um, because they're just so complicated and so frustrating to use. Um, another th nice thing I like about Python is uh, you don't have to deal with pointers. You don't have stacks and heaps. You don't have string parsing problems. You don't have a lot of bullshit that you get with C or C++. Again, I write five to 10 hours of C++ a day. So I know this. Uh, I use these application, uh, this application. I write this kind of code. I still hate it. Uh, even if it's efficient, it's just, it's so scary to write um, compared to Python, where if you divide by zero, you don't get a hard fault and your entire microcontroller just stops working. Um, instead, you get a Python interpreter that tells you, hey, on this line, dear sir, you made a mistake. Please fix. Um, the only thing I would like is instead of white space, I wish there was brackets. Um, I'm going to bring this up at the next Python Software Foundation meeting, and hopefully I can convince them to uh, get rid of white space and use brackets and semicolons instead. OK, so how does CircuitPython fit into this? And in case you're wondering, like, what the hell does this have to do with Linux, we're getting there. So around, let's see, 2015, I think, is when the micro bit came out, Arduino killer. But what I really liked, it wasn't Arduino-shaped, thank God. Right? They actually kind of went in a totally different direction. It, the idea was low-cost microcontroller for kids, uh, the cheapest possible thing to get people started with programming um, that had like these LEDs on the front and buttons. And, and chances are, again, you have one of these because like, everyone seems to have one of these. Um, and this is on the back. And the reason that this was, to me, really amazing um, and inspiring is that chip on the back, this, this one right here. So this chip, the NRF51822, I was familiar with this chip. This chip totally sucks. <laughs> what do I mean? It's, it is a 32-bit ARM Cortex chip, but compared to the chips that were being used for MicroPython, because this, this came up a little bit after MicroPython and Esperino and the Tessel. If you remember, those were like running at 72 megahertz, and they had 200K of RAM, and they were just like these massive chips. And this one was like really dinky by comparison. Um, even at the, the most expensive variant, you only got 32K of RAM. And that's like not very much. I mean, it is compared to like 16F84 with like 60 eight bytes of RAM, but it's still not very much, um, especially if you want to do uh, Bluetooth stuff as well. And so that was really interesting to me because it was almost the same specifications as the SAMD21 chip. And you're like, okay, well, I don't, why well, I'm not even, like, you're like, why even keep track of what these chips are? The reason that this chip is interesting, it was used in the latest Arduino that had just come out. And this Arduino, which, you know, looks like the, uh, you know, the, the original Arduino Uno, it was running, this was their kind of the next generation. It was the um, first ARM core, you know, 32 bit microcontroller based Arduino. And I was like, oh my God, it, it is technically possible that we could get MicroPython to run on this. The only reason that I didn't end up going with Esperino or JavaScript is because MicroPython was kind of the first thing to prove that it could run on something um, this underpowered compared to what the Tessel was running, for example. Because I looked at that and I was like, oh, well, it's obvious that you can run JavaScript on a microcontroller, but um, what you're talking about there is, is a $99 board. I like something that was more closer, again, to $30. Um, so this is where Scott comes in. This is a photo of Scott with Blinka, the mascot. We, we made a, a gigantic puppet. Um, we know uh, there's a woman in New York who works on the Muppet show. Well, she's not. we can't say that. She works on a common puppeteering show that folks are familiar with, and uh, we hired her to make a puppet. It's not a Muppet, because that's trademarked. Um, so we sent him an email, uh, because we'd seen him on the show and tell, and he was working with this chip a lot. And uh, he started a hardware company and then realized he didn't really want to do that anymore. And so we emailed and we said, hey, uh, we have this idea. Right? And he's like, OK, what do you, you want to do? And he basically said, look, can you just like port MicroPython to this new chip that the Arduino is using? And why? 
Because if you have people, well, let me go back. If you have people who have these Arduinos already, it's going to be a lot easier to overcome that activation energy and get them to use CircuitPython or MicroPython because they already have something that's Arduino. It's not as scary, right? Whereas um, a lot of these boards, it, the, ESP, the ESP layer, came, this is a much later photo, but when this first came out, the Tessel and Esprino and, and Pi board, you had to have specialized hardware to do it, whereas now it was more generic. Um, so we actually started making hardware that could run MicroPython. And it was, you could use Arduino or MicroPython and can go back and forth, which is kind of cool. And we started writing libraries. Um, this is code that would let you use hardware. Um, and this is actually when I had um, a, a big change of heart. Because basically, I looked at our GitHub repo. And it's, it, this is, I took a screenshot today, you know, 1,500 repositories. Um, but it was still like over 1,000 at the time. And I was like, oh my god, I, I, can't, I can't have so many repositories. I have to be careful here. Because um, I have 400, 500 Arduino libraries. This is the, the Arduino library listing. And it says 476 results for Adafruit. And I was starting to have you know, three libraries per this temperature sensor that I talked about. I'd have one for Arduino. I had one for Python, which was for the Raspberry Pi we mentioned that would run in the command line. And I would have one for you know, MicroPython or CircuitPython. And um, I really, really did not want to have that 450 turn into an additional 450 and then another 450 because my inbox is already a uh, toxic wasteland. Um, and we had already written about 30 libraries of our most popular boards for Python. Um, that's the Raspberry Pi, you know, Python 2, 2.7. Um, and I realized, like, I really wanted to combine at least the Python and MicroPython together. And it, by the time we kind of got to this point, it was like a year or two later, um, Scott really wanted to have a unified interface and kind of came up with, these are not like the, the hard and fast rules. Rules are meant to be broken. But we wanted to use mass storage for file management because using a command line tool was actually too complicated for some people. Um, and another thing is that if you had a Chromebook, you might not be able to install command line tools at all. So mass storage is kind of the only universal you know, interface for USB that every computer runs. Um, even serial ports aren't always easy to open on a Chromebook. Um, we wanted to have an, a consistent API across all ports. So any board that had CircuitPython, MicroPython, um, it would always, that code would always run on each one. And we wanted to make sure that it was a pure subset of CPython, even if that meant that it was simpler and slower. And that was so that we could have code that runs on Raspberry Pi or microcontrollers, the same driver code. Um, and this is when we actually decided to split the fork, because this is something that we felt really strongly about, because I did not want to maintain another 1,000 libraries. And MicroPython folks were like, well, this is, you know, we have our own direction. And so we said, OK, well, how about we, we fork it, we rename our, ourselves to CircuitPython. It's the same underlying Python uh, code underneath, but that API level is going to be a little bit different, because these were really important to us. Um, so for example, time. What time is it? I have about 15 minutes. So um, on CircuitPython on the top, when you import time and you look at all the you know, functions available in that module, you see local time, instruct, and sleep. And then if I go down to my computer and I run Python 3 and I import time and do the same thing, you'll see I have more stuff. I have process time. I have time zones. I have ASCII time, alt zone. But everything in CircuitPython is a strict subset. There is no code that you should be able to run in CircuitPython that would not also run on um, Python 3. And that was really a good idea, because by this point, there was like a lot of Raspberry Pi computers, because Raspberry Pi kept coming out with new ones. And this is like, even this is 2018. It's even worse now, right? It's not worse, better. There's even more amazing Raspberry Pi computers. Um, and this is when, uh, you know, it's like, there's like the Teenage Mutant, teenage ninja, Mut <sighs> teenage ninja Mutant Turtles, whatever. I can't say it anymore. Um, and that was a really popular TV show, and all the kids were watching it. And so, like, all these other animation studios were like, oh, my God, we need to have some sort of, like, teenage, like, amphibian, like, fighting ninja show. And so there's, like, Battletoads, and there's, like, Street Sharks. 
And so that's just like the battle toads zone of single board computers because Raspberry Pi was so successful that suddenly everybody that had chips was making single board computers. This is a banana pie. This is an orange pie. Like I, like I have kind of the fruit names really popular. This is onion IO. They didn't go with the pie, but it's still food based. Um, you have Odroid and you've got Tinkerboard. This is from Asus. Um, basically, uh, it's a jaunty angle here. Um, you've got the NVIDIA came out with their own, uh, Jetson Nano. And um, this is just like the categorizations on Wikipedia of like, there's like 54 categories, companies making single board computers. And each one easily makes 10. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of single board computers. And um, each one of them had like kind of slightly different ways to interface with the GPIO. Like they're all running like Armbian or Debian kind of, some were running Ubuntu, but they're all kind of running mainline Linux. Um, but then if you actually wanted to twiddle those GPIO pins, the, the pins that would replace the parallel port, it's like a little different. And like this one you can do it through pip. Um, this one you have to like download this like Dushing K33 slash Orange Pi, and then like set up install from inside of it. And um, I want to give credit to Periphery because uh, among others, they're one of the few libraries that tried really hard to say, hey, everybody, let's like have one standard for all of these hundreds of boards so people don't have to install a different package from some random ass GitHub repo. Um, and we use Periphery, actually. They're, uh, they're pretty cool. But then we have these other weird boards. We have um, the FT232H. This is a device that you plug it into USB and it gives you GPIO connected to a computer. So um, it's a bit banging USB device and you can use LibUSB with it. And so you can connect it to your computer and then on your computer you run Python 3 and then you can blink LEDs, for example. So you're running Python, but not on a Raspberry Pi and not on a microcontroller. It's on your computer and you're controlling hardware. Um, so, for example, an uh, EEPROM chip, you know, you want to program this EEPROM chip. It's a 512K EEPROM. You can't fit that on an Arduino. But if you have it on your file system, it makes a lot more sense. It's quite easy to program it using an FTDI um, adapter. So we've got microcontrollers with low resources and lots of hardware. Single board computers like the Raspberry Pi, medium resources and um, some hardware, like a lot, but not everything. And then desktop computers, which are like the most powerful. They have access to everything, but low hardware. And we wanted to make this all work together. So why not come up with a new standard? Why not, indeed? Um, and so this is where Tux and Blinka, the love story begins. They become best friends. Hi, wonderful graphics. So Blinka started as CircuitPython running on the SAMD21, these microcontroller boards. But we wrote so many libraries um, that we decided let's make a way for all of our libraries, for all these sensors and these LEDs and displays and motors to work with anybody. So we wrote Adafruit Blinka, which is a way of using the hardware API from CircuitPython, which remember we defined as a strict subset of CPython, so you could run all of these sensors and devices on um, any computer. Uh, so we started with the Raspberry Pi because, of course, it's the most popular. Um, and it's actually interesting. You'd think, like, well, how hard can it be? It actually turns out that there's, like, four different types of Raspberry Pi that you have to deal with. There's the compute modules, have a lot of pins. The Rev1 and Rev2 have different pinouts, and then the 40 pin is a different. So it, it turns out, like, even, even just dealing with one subset of the single board computer market is, uh, is different. Um, and then it's funny, as I was writing this, I'd like this issue came in. How do I run this on NanoPi? Uh, you know, I want to run your Raspberry Pi projects on a, a NanoPi, which is a, which is a Pi clone. And uh, it turns out like, yeah, we have uh, support for the NanoPi too. And we have support for computers using the um, FTDI converter chip as well. So if you go to circuitpython.org slash Blinka, you will see that we have banana pies, beagle bones, Dragon boards, Clockwork Pies, Jets and Nanos, 60 different boards altogether that um, are supported with this library that let you do sensors, GPIO, PWM, analog inputs, all equivalently with the same code over this entire family. Um, and it's cool because we actually have people submitting new boards. Like a couple days ago, somebody um, you know sent over a PR for the Lubencat IMX. 6ULL. What is it? I don't know, but it's supported now. Uh, the Orange Pi Zero Plus board 
Thanks, TWA127. And then we are also adding uh, board support. Maker Melissa is, is works on the team, and she has been adding um, support for, uh, like, the Nano Pi Neo. What is it? I don't know. I mean, I have these boards. There's just, like, there's just like hundreds of them. They're, like, super cute, these little Linux boards. Um, you know, some of them are, are only $10 or so. Uh, some of them have gigabit Ethernet, whatever you want. Um, so the upshot is, is that once I had that fear of the, oh my god, I'm going to have three libraries per device removed, I was able to then um, actually go in and, and, and really start developing libraries. And so we have 283 libraries so far. Some of them are hardware specific, but about 250 of them, I think, are going to be generic enough that run on everything. And these are like OLED screens and sensors and uh, NRF, uh, NFC card readers and, and all that good stuff. Pretty much every, every electronic device you'd want. LEDs, like NeoPixels, all that. Um, we also have community contributions, which is awesome. Um, I, I, you know, I want to make sure, oh, sorry, and at the bottom right, there's also people. There's like a group of people from the community that help us manage PRs and issues. And there's people who are submitting their own libraries. So there's a, a, a library for the Mitsutoyu Digimatic calipers. I guess you can read data off of it. Um, or there's for Dynamixels. These are servos that are used in high-end robotics. Somebody submitted a library that uses the standard API. Um, and it's cool. We have a really powerful community of a lot of people who come in with different backgrounds. Some are really into Linux. Some are into microcontrollers. Some are into ham radio. It's neat. It, what you're seeing what people can do with this once they're free to move from chip to chip, from platform to platform, um, reducing that support burden, but squeezing down that iteration loop. That's what's really important to me. Um, okay, so there was this Thai restaurant, and it's, it closed a long, long time ago. It wasn't it wasn't like a COVID thing, but they had this dish called duck three ways and I loved it. It was like they, they had a duck and it was like some duck breast and some confit and then there was like some skin. Anyways, I'm going to do duck three ways. I'm not going to do it live because I, I learned my lesson not to, I don't want to stress out the organizers, but I did take screenshots of connecting to a temperature and humidity sensor three ways and showing how it's the same. So it's actually kind of boring. It's the same kind of duck, quack or something. Um, to start with the Pico, uh, this just came out. This is a microcontroller from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, it's uh, got an incredible large amount of RAM. It's running at 200 megahertz, but it's actually only a Cortex M0 chip. It's actually kind of designed specifically, or it's optimized for running CircuitPython or MicroPython, which I think is awesome. Um, so you can download and install uh, CircuitPython by dragging and dropping a file onto the chip, which shows up as a disk drive. And uh, this morning, I wired it up to this sensor, which I have somewhere here on my desk, uh, HT, AHT20 temperature and humidity reader. You wire up power, ground, and then the two data lines um, for, for data transmission. Um, again, at CircuitPython, it shows up like a disk drive. Uh, on the disk drive, I drag over AHT 0.py, the, the library file, which defines how you read data over I2C and turn that into temperature readings and humidity readings. Um, there's some, you know, F7 SD and the meta never index and trashes. That's the Mac stuff that yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with. Boot.out.txt is sort of like the message for microcontrollers. It tells you like the, when you boot up, it kind of gives you a little bit of output telling it the state. So you can debug if something happened on boot. Um, Bus device is a helper that um, makes it, it has some macros that makes it easy. It's in Python as well, but it's in a folder. And then you open up code.py in your favorite text editor, like Moo, um, or you can use really any text editor. I also use Atom sometimes, or, or people use VS Studio or VS Code. And um, in this case, uh, the code, you import the time, you import uh, board and bus IO and the sensor. Uh, it's a, it's just, this is plain Python code for those who may not be familiar with it. You create an I2C bus device saying, I want to communicate digitally over these two pins. You uh, instantiate the sensor, and then you just read the temperature and relative humidity. And at the bottom, you get um, the temperature and humidity printed out in uh, degree C and percentage. Wonderful. OK, so great. So now I have that code is running on the Pico. Um, but now I'm going to pick out my Raspberry Pi 4. It's uh, kind of the newest Raspberry Pi model. And uh, in this case, there's no download. Instead, you follow the installation instructions. You know, we have a shell script that you can run, but basically you have to enable I2C and you have to install Python 3 and all that, all that stuff that you're used to when you're installing software. If you've not installed Python 3 before, 
You wire it up, again, uh, connect to the GPIO, power, ground, two data pins. You pip install the library, I already have, but you can see all the dependencies are managed for you, uh, including, uh, I'm trying to say Blinka is here somewhere. I don't know, maybe I already have it installed. Oh yeah, here it is, Blinka gets installed first. Has all these dependencies, including that RPI GPIO. Um, I cat the example code, which is essentially the same as the, the previous code, except there's a default I've squared C port. Um, and then same thing, I print out temperature and humidity. I run it from the shell and it prints out to standard output. And finally, I uh, want to run it on Windows. I have my Windows computer. I grab my MCP2221, which is like the FTDI board. It just happens to be the one I like more because it's, it's so petite. Um, in my Windows command prompt, I pip install the same library that I installed on the Raspberry Pi, so it gets all my dependencies for me. Uh, I open up Notepad, which is my preferred editor in Windows. I don't know. It, it was just convenient. I paste in that exact same code. I open up my command prompt and I go to the desktop and I run that code and the same exact output shows up. Same code, same output on a microcontroller, on a microcomputer, or a desktop computer. And so what I think is neat is that CircuitPython, while we originally sort of designed it as the easiest way to program microcontrollers, we wanted to shrink that loop of, you know, take away the compile and upload to make it edit, run, edit, run, make it very fast because it's interpreted and you can do that. It turns out that it's actually kind of the best way to program electronics in general. So by using Blinka with CircuitPython, CircuitPython sort of becomes like, it's a language, yes, based on Python, but it's more than that, it's more like an API. And that API can be implemented in CPython that allows you to experiment and write code and interface with hardware on any device, single board computers, desktops running any oper operating system, as well as microcontroller boards. So um, especially for those of you who have Linux running on your favorite little funky single board computer, if we don't support your board in Blinka, please open up an issue. Um, we will try to get one, or you can follow our guides we have on how to uh, implement it yourself. We have a tutorial on how to add the detection code, which is actually kind of the hardest part, to telling which single board computer you're running, and then uh, defining all the pins and uh, peripherals so that Blinka knows what to look for and can make sure that the code runs smoothly on your favorite single board computer. Thank you. I finished just on time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Limo. Okay. That was an uh, excellent journey of microcontrollers. I know. I took you on a place, and then now you're back to where you started. It was great watching all the commentary along the side and the chat stream. There was lots yeah. of really excited people talking about all the different things that they've done with their Arduinos and microcontrollers and Raspberry Pis. Yeah. Um, have, you, have you built electronic projects with... Arduino I've done a little bit myself, but nowhere near as much as people like our swag badge team. Um, so I can give you an update on your question about why there's only two screens on the swag badge. Um, they said that it's simply because they didn't have time to do six screens on there. Oh, okay. So. That's a good reason. Yeah. <laughs> next next year, six six screens. Maybe like a cube. I think so. That'd be kind of fun. Like a little like a Yeah, dive. that would be pretty fun to play uh, with. Three dimensional badges. That's where it's at. All right. Well, so, thanks so much. I, you know, we don't have question answer, of course, for the keynote you told me, but um, folks can come by our Discord, um, and they can. Yeah. Here's what I think I'm going to do. I'm going to stop. No, you stop my screen. Share. I've got to share. No, I have to stop years. my thing. Well, that's exciting. I'm going to share this window. Okay. So if you could pop up the thing. So if you go to circuitpython.org and um, you can uh, read all about it and all, you know, you can click on Blinka if you want to see all these boards. But if you go to contributing um, and you look here, let me get nice and big, there is a Discord. So if you're on Discord, and I think almost everybody watching is probably on Discord because I think you have to be to <laughs> go here, um, you can click on this link to go to the Adafruit Discord, this is an invite, and then we're in the Circuit Python channel, and you can ask us all sorts of questions, um, because I'm sure people have all sorts of detailed questions. And uh, we have a community. We also I'm have sure a do. weekly meeting Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, um, almost every Monday except when there's a holiday. Uh, you can come by and you can be a total newbie. It's it's a voice chat, but also text chat for those who don't uh, like to do voice. 
Excellent. Okay, cool. That's really good. Thank you very much, Limo. All right, thank you. Thanks for coming along to LCA. Thanks for having me.